We're very blessed today to have Dr. Gary and Wanda Stewart here to minister to us on the Star of Bethlehem and a special treat right at the, towards the closing. So, Gary, we turn it to you, brother. Can we give the Lord a hand of appreciation for them coming? And I just want to begin by, by saying uh, uh, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And may you just be filled with, with, with who he is. And I want to say to you, I am very thankful for you because you are a witness for the cause of Christ. I'm thankful you know Jesus, those of you who do, those of you who are uh, about to. <laughs> uh, you're, you're inquiring, you're wanting to know more about God, you're coming to a place to be educated in the things of God, and you're a good witness here in this part of the world. I'm thankful we got a good witness in Granbury, Texas. We, we need each other all over the world. Oh, how we need each other. And I am very, very thankful for you. I have pastored for 35 years and now feel the call of God to travel and teach because the, the gift of God upon my life is, is the teaching gift. And I just want to come and share. But I have no desire to just come and teach and leave. My desire is to teach and connect. I want you to receive from God today. I want, I want God to, to, to connect with what I say. I want to leave a spiritual gift with you today. And the, and the spiritual gift I particularly want to leave with you today is a greater awe of God. We're going to look at the stars. We're going to see some things uh, using astronomy software and things that, that helped us see what the wise men saw and and I, and I just believe you're going to be awestruck by it. And so today, let us allow God to come and strike us with the awe that, that, that only He can do. But before we go there, uh, I want you to get your hope up. Uh, now abides faith, hope, and love. These three. The greatest of these is love. But I want to talk about the faith and hope. You can't separate faith and hope. Faith creates hope. Hope keeps faith alive. They just, they just work hand in hand. But without hope, we're, we're in despair. So I want you to hope for, for, for things in your life. I want you to hope for what you have faith in. And I want you to expect. Hope expects. I want you to hope and expect God to be here this morning. God to show up. God to meet a need in your life or someone else's life here. I want you to look for Him today. I want you to have an expectancy. Where's God going to show up this morning in this service? And, and He has been. He's been here with us. Wow, I loved worship. It was such a good time. And, and I just really got into His presence. And so He is here where two or three are gathered in my name. I am in the midst of them. Let's expect Him to do some things in our lives today. How many of you... How many of you want to increase your expectancy? Amen. Amen. Let me, let me read you a little passage of Scripture. Uh, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hope, lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence of Behind the veil. It's your hope that carries you into the presence <laughs> behind the veil. It's something about hope that gets you into a presence of God. Expectancy. God's here. God's going to do something in my, my midst today, corporately or individually, but God's going to show up. And I'm expecting Him today. So let us pray right now and let us ask God to just come in His own special way. Father, we are so thankful for Your presence that's already manifested itself and which will increase as we move through our uh, presentation this morning. Come with Your might and come with Your power and touch our lives as only You can. In Jesus' name, deposit in us the awe of God the marvel of what God has done in the heavens. And teach us your ways 
In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen. Um, we might want to, do you want to do these lights any differently, Alan? This will help you see just a little bit better. We experimented with these lights yesterday. Didn't we do one more? Very good. Can you see well? All right, good. Um, this is this is the name of the ministry. Thought it was quite original. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I have three passions in my heart. I just want to, this so you can pray about me after I leave here. I have three passions in my heart. The love of God on the earth. I, 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 I love to do seminars on the Father heart of God and see God baptize people in the love of God. This, this is a, a passion of mine. A second is what I'm showing today, the awe of God in the heavens. I want people to be awestruck by God as well as experience His love. And, you're, of course, you're all struck by His love. But I just mean just be wowed by what God has done. My third passion is discipleship. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. And we need to learn how to make disciples, and we need to get quality in the making of disciples. And so I, uh, I do my best to help churches uh, develop a strong discipleship program. Uh, This, just, just give me a little credit, or giving credit where credit is due. I'm not the first person to study what I'm going to be sharing with you uh, this morning. Uh, you see a list of books there. You see some presentations I've been to, some research that I have done. Uh, notice the bottom line, uh, astronomy software that I use, Starry Night Pro. And this let me say about uh, uh, astronomy software. Astronomy is such an exact science that we're able to send uh, probes to the outer planets. Uh, we're, we're able to, uh, we keep everything correct time-wise because of the position of the stars and the movement of the planets. It is so precise that we even keep our atomic clock accurate by the way the heavens move. And that's how we know we're in the right sequences of time. And uh, with astronomy software, though, since they finally got all these calculations and put it into where you can put it in a little old laptop like this, with astronomy software, you can go anywhere in the past for about 10,000 years or more to anywhere in the future about 10,000 years or more. And you can go to any spot on the planet Earth or you can even go into outer space at a planet and look. And you can look at uh, what the heavens look like at that particular point in time. And so it's just amazing that you can. Well, one thing I got excited about was what was that star that the wise men followed? What, what, what was it? And uh, so, so we, uh, we, we, we tried to go there. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Uh, this, this is the scripture that really grabbed me a number of years ago as I began to look for some things in the heaven. The, the heavens declare, the Bible says. They do not decide anything. They just declare things. I have a detailed study entitled The Heavens Declare in which I use astronomy software to show how clearly and loudly the starry night declares the awesome message of God's glory. It's a study that shows God's purpose in placing the stars in the heavens and why He named all the stars. You recall the Scripture says God named all the stars. Well, why would God name all the stars if God didn't intend for us to know what those names were? And they have some meaning apparently to them. The book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, and very possibly the oldest book in human history, uh, speaks of and mentions the constellations. It mentions several constellations that are in the heavens. And that God brings them out uh, uh, as He sees fit in His seasons, and He brings them out by number, and He calls them by name. He's talking about the constellations that are in the heavens. And so God created the constellations for a reason. And it's to tell the most glorious story you've ever heard as you, as you understand the meaning behind those stars and, and those constellations. And the heavens declare, which uh, I hope you get to see at a, at a future date, uh, is something that shows that awesome story. And it is a study that debunks horoscopes and astrology because that's nothing but a lie of the enemy. 
the, star, the starry story that God told Adam and Eve and that has carried through the centuries then was such an awesome story that Satan had to pervert it. And he spent years perverting it. And that's where we come up with what is now horoscopes and astrology. It's a perversion of the truth. You see, all the enemy does is take truth and pervert it. Well, I think it's time we took this back from the camp of the enemy. I think the enemy has had it long enough. And we need to go back. And if you ever get a chance to see my presentation on the heavens declare, you will see how awesome is that story that God tells every night. Every night the story is told. To all of mankind. That's awesome when, 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 when you get there. But for today, I will only show you a part of that presentation. Today we're going to look, at, and very appropriately so, because of the time of the year it is, at the star of Christ's birth. And we'll begin with the biblical reference to this star. Matthew 2, 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, the old wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying... Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Notice first of all that they came when? After Jesus was born. Everybody say after. after. I've got a manger scene in my house. Probably many of you do. Many churches have it on their lawns and things. And they're almost always incorrect because they have the wise men at the manger when Jesus was born. Uh, the Bible very plainly says in Matthew chapter 2, I believe it's verse 11, that the wise men came to the house where Jesus was. When the wise men show up, Jesus is several months, possibly even a year or two old by the time the wise men get there. So they come after Jesus is born. They do not show up and go to the manger and there's the animals and stuff that we have. And I've got one in my house. I know we've been programmed this way, but it's just not the way it was. Let's look at what the Bible says and, and, and see that. Verse 2 says, Where is he who has been, has been born king of the Jews? Uh, so, who are these wise men? Well, they were counselors to the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Medes, the Persians, and others. They were teachers and priests and physicians and seers and interpreters of dreams. They were men whose wisdom was highly sought out by the heads of the government in this day and time. They were astronomers, and some of them, sad to say, were astrologers because astrology had already started making its way into uh, what the heavens were by the time these wise men get there. The Old Testament prophet was foremost among such wise men. and uh, He elevated this office to the highest that, that, that there was uh, uh, in the land in Babylon. And, of course, being a, a, a good uh, a Jew... He, he, he instructed and told the, the people about the coming of the Messiah and would have in, instructed uh, about uh, the, the Genesis account where it says, out of Judah uh, will the Messiah come. And so the, the wise men of Babylon were the elite of the wise men of the world. Uh, every, every leading king uh, would have had his own court uh, astronomers uh, to guide him in things. What are the heavens declaring? And some of them had already turned that into astrology stuff and, and horoscope type things. And they were moving in extreme paganism, uh, many of them. But there were still the astronomers who were looking for the right stuff. And so these are the wise men. So when the wise men show up in Jerusalem from Babylon, everybody listens. Whoa, these are the top guys in the world who have come over here. Now, Notice they have seen his star in the east, which simply means that this star rose in the east like all other stars rise in the east. But it was a star that marked the birth of the Messiah, the king of the Jews. It is apparent, though, that Herod and the religious leaders and all of Jerusalem were unaware of this star because the scripture says, look at it, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And then down in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them, what time did the star appear? So it had become very obvious from Scripture here that uh, Jerusalem and Herod and religious leaders hadn't noticed anything. So 
we again have this conception because of our manger scenes and stuff that's printed on the Christmas cards we get and everything, that this was some real bright big star out here with some kind of a tail that went all the way down and pointed to where baby Jesus was. Uh, If that was so, when the wise men got to Jerusalem, they would have seen people out there going, (laughs) looking at, what, 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 what? They didn't. Nobody was aware. Isn't that obvious from Scripture? When did this star appear? We didn't even know it was out there. So it's some kind of a regular star, and they needed some interpretation by people who knew how to understand what the heavens are declaring. And that's what the wise men came and told them. Now, when Herod heard this, he got the religious leaders together to find out where... Uh, the child would be born, uh, Bethlehem, as we all know the story. He sends them to Bethlehem to tell them to return to him when they have found the child. And then, then it says, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, how does a star stand over something? Well, I will show you that uh, momentarily, but... Uh, Then verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. This is the same star, and there's still going to be nothing about it that would get the public's attention. The wise men knew it was the same star, but when it stops over where they have been told the king of the Jews was to be born, they were exceedingly joyful. Now, uh, some information about stars. Uh, Our sun that warms us every day, is the closest star to us. All of those stars that you go outside at night and look at are like our sun, only they're vastly huger than our sun. They are just so far away. Uh, The closest star to planet Earth is 25 trillion, that's 12 zeros, 25 trillion miles away. Uh, our, our sun is 93 million miles away. That's just a hop, skip, and a jump compared to 25 trillion miles away. Uh, it is a huge distance out there. They're all larger than our sun. So if this had been a star that came and whoo, got down here close enough to be a big star like that, we'd all be French fries in just a little while. And be nothing left, you know. So, so this, this, this is something that the wise men had interpreted. I'm going to show you in a few minutes as to why I believe they interpreted what they did. Okay, if we're going to use astronomy software to try to find this, then we're going to have to determine when was Christ born. Well, our Bible tells us this criteria, that Caesar Augustus, Quirinius, and Herod were all ruling in their various places, and shepherds were in the field. Now, if shepherds are in the field, then that means there's grass in the field, and that means they're out there with them at night, as we know the story tells us. That's not the dead of winter, folks. That's not December 25th uh, when, when this takes place because uh, it's too, uh, shepherds aren't in the field at night uh, that time of year. So he's, uh, when, when Jesus was born, it was when shepherds were in the field. All right, let's look at when all of these three, numbers one, two, and three, when were they uh, in office? And history tells us these are the dates when they were in office, and the only time that is uh, uh, common to all three of these, and which will be our search window, is between 3 and 1 B.C. That's the only dates that all three of those uh, fit in, of course, not being wintertime, when the shepherds were in their field. So according to biblical and historical record, our window of time for the birth of Christ must fall between 3 and 1 B.C., and of course the shepherds were in their field. How could Christ be born B.C.? B.C. means before Christ. Uh, The way this is done is we use today a modern calendar called the Gregorian calendar. It was put together and finally initiated, I believe it was 1582, by uh, some, uh, some monks uh, who put this thing together. And they started with 1 A.D. as the birth of Christ, and they moved forward in history from there. And uh, 1582, when they were alive, is how far the calendar had gotten by that time. And that's the Gregorian calendar that took two or 300 years for the whole world to adopt, and which we all use now as the Gregorian calendar. 
But in that two or three hundred years, they have found there were errors in the, in the bringing together the Gregorian calendar, and they missed a point or two, and so it shoved the 1 A.D. backwards a little ways, which means that uh, Jesus was actually born before 1 A.D., and the only way we can do that in our calendars is, is B.C. So Jesus was born before Christ. <laughs> do you understand that? Uh, so he's, he's born on the other side of the line they originally uh, set up. So using astronomy software, we will begin our search of the night sky during that period of 3 to 1 B.C. But before we do, I want to show you a sign in the heavens that the Bible clearly mentions. This is in your Bible. It's Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth." I want you to notice three things about this sign. Where was it? It was in the heavens. And it was a woman clothed with the sun. And the moon is under her feet. Now, here you are looking with astronomy software at a woman. Virgo is uh, the, the woman in the sky. Virgo meaning virgin. And if you heard my other presentation, you would find that Virgo is the constellation that declares that a virgin will have a son who is desired for many years. He will be despised and rejected. He will give his life for mankind, and he will ultimately return as the gatherer of his people. Sounds rather biblical, doesn't it? Uh, But uh, Virgo, and so there you have a woman clothed with the sun. You see the little moon down there at the bottom with the moon at her feet. Now, using astronomy software, I can turn the sun off, and uh, you can see this better. You, that's what the night sky would look like if the sun were, were somewhere else at this particular time. The days that the moon was at her feet were a couple of days, September 11 and 12, 3 B.C., using our Gregorian calendar. Now, let me add some illustrations, because people through the years have tried to put illustrations in to illustrate a woman uh, with Virgo, and this is the one my computer software has. So here you see a woman. She's clothed with the sun. It's there at her elbow, and you see the moon at her feet, and it's in the heavens. This is, a, this is Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, a woman clothed with the sun. But something else Revelation 12, 1 said, and on her head a garland of 12 stars, or above her head uh, uh, a crown. And what was her crown? Well, the crown of Virgo that stands always above her is the constellation of Judah. Uh, Leo, the constellation, Leo is the constellation for for the Lion of Judah. Uh, It's the constellation in the heavens that represents Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who prevails over and destroys the work of Satan in the last days. Revelation 5, 5, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed. Let me add the illustrations. You see the lion there. So here we see Leo above the head of Virgo. Leo is her crown. Now remember this date, September 12, 3 B.C. Uh, With this date in mind, I now want to show you what I believe the wise men saw and why they hurried to Jerusalem with treasure gifts for the young child. Using astronomy software, I'll take you back to that time and we'll look at the starry sky and what I believe the wise men saw. We're now moving to Babylon. You're at Babylon, uh, and it's 3 a, 3.45 a.m. in the morning, August the 26th, 3 B.C. August 26th is not what we're after. 3 B.C. is what we're after. As an astronomer or one of the wise men, it would prob- possibly be your night to stand and watch the skies all night, and you would have noticed at 3.45 a.m. Uh, these things happening. Jupiter is rising in the east as every star, all everything rises in the east. Uh, along with the constellation Leo and the star Regulus. Now, for centuries, the planet Jupiter had been known as the king planet, and the star Regulus, the brightest star in the constellation Leo, was known as the king star. So the king planet and the king star are about to get the wise men's attention. Now, since that's down on the lower part of our screen, I'm going to center everything up to a center view here. Uh, and I'm going to add a red tail to Jupiter so you can plot, uh, plot Jupiter over time uh, through the sky. This is August 26. Here we are, September 12, 3 B.C. Uh, this is uh, 
what the wise men saw. They saw Jupiter and Regulus conjunct. Now, what do we mean by conjunction of stars is that they appear to us from our perspective on earth, they appear to touch. They're millions of miles apart, but they're millions of miles apart in depth. But so to us down here on earth, these two objects come in line with each other and they look like a bigger star than normal when they conjunct. Uh, so here we are, it's conjunction, uh, and, it, and notice this happened September 12, 3 B.C. Now that's interesting to me because that's the same date as Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. So this could well mark the birth of Christ. Uh, at any rate, it's marking something as we, will, as we will see. So here we are. Jupiter moves on through the heavens. Uh, this is November the 30th. And on November the 30th, Jupiter goes into retrograde motion. Everybody say retrograde. retrograde. All right, let me explain retrograde motion. Retrograde motion simply means Jupiter's about to stop in the heavens and it's about to go backwards. We say, how does a planet go backwards through the heavens? It doesn't. It goes into retrograde motion. Here's retrograde motion. You're driving down the interstate. You're my, uh, this hand over here. And you're driving at 70 miles per hour. And there's a car in front of you that is going 50 miles per hour. So you know what's going to happen. You're going to come up alongside them. Now, when you're in this position, it's very obvious to both of you that you're going forward. But when you pull up beside them and look out your uh, passenger side window, for a moment there, it appears as though they what? Stop. They're just dead still for a moment. And then as you watch out your side window, they appear to be going backwards. Are they going backwards? No, they're going down that road at 50 miles per hour. But you're going faster than they are. They appear to go backwards. And as you look in your rear view mirror, then it appears that both of you go forward again. Well, same thing with planets. Here's Earth zipping through space. Oh, by the way, you're moving through space right now at 66,600 miles per hour. Zoom. We are going through space. And your wife says, you never go anywhere. You know. <laughs> So, so here, here comes, here, here's, here's Jupiter out here. It's poking. And, and, and here comes Earth zooming by. Well, for a moment there, Jupiter's going to look like it stops to us down here on Earth. For, and then it's going to look like it goes backwards, and then it's going to look like it goes forward again. That's retrograde motion. Do you understand? Okay. Now, what's this little starry dance that's going to take place here? So Jupiter stops in the heavens uh, from our perspective down here on Earth. And here we are, January 10, it's headed back toward Regulus. And here we are, February 15, it conjuncts a second time with Regulus, which is highly unusual for it to conjunct a second time. It continues forward on April 1st, and then it uh, begins to go forward again. And it comes back, and on May the 8th, Jupiter and Regulus conjunct for the third time. So this is something... Something that uh, is happening up here, three conjunctions with the king star, with the king planet. And I think this has the wise men's attention. I think they're saying, what, what is God saying? What, what is God saying here? And of course, they're from Babylon. They got the influence of Daniel in all of this. And, uh, uh, but I don't think they're ready to, to, to jump on their camel and, and head for Jerusalem. But I want you to notice over in the right-hand corner, do you see that little star, that star, and a traveling star is the way they were looked at back in that day, but the planet Venus. And uh, watch Venus now. Venus moves faster than, 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 than the rest of us. And uh, so here you are, June 2, Jupiter's going on its way now, and Venus is starting to catch up with Jupiter. And June 10, uh, Venus is closing in on Jupiter. And June 17, 2 B.C., Jupiter and Venus conjunct. And this is one of the brightest stars that has ever been seen by man. Now, not, not meaning they've never conjuncted before. This was just unusually bright because of proximity, location. And matter of fact, planetaria, I have been told, planetaria around the world, that's those places you go in that put all the stars on the overhead and show you different things. Planetaria around the world show June 17, 2 B.C., uh, as one of their presentations because that was so bright. It was so amazingly bright uh, that evening. Now, here's an interesting thing to me. 
the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus happens during the 40th week from September 12. And what's 40 weeks, ladies? Gestation period. 40 weeks is gestation. That's pregnancy. It's 40 weeks. So from June 12th to this was uh, like a child. Now, I, I'm not saying that's the date of the birth, but I, I, I'm, I'm personally convinced between June 12th, to, I mean uh, September 12th to June 17, there's your window. Christ is born. And I think this announces it to the wise men. Oh, wow. Now, with that little starry dance around Regulus, and then this conjunction like this, buddies, let's go. He's been born. The Messiah. See, these are Messiah-oriented wise men. They know a Messiah is coming. Where did this starry dance take place? What's that constellation? Leo. Leo is representative of Judah. And in Genesis 48... The Messiah will come out of Judah. Where are the Jews at this time in life? Jerusalem. Where are the wise men putting all this together in their heads? The king has been born. The Messiah that's been promised through the centuries is in. Let's go to Jerusalem and go worship the new king who has been born. And so I believe this is what uh, had them uh, to, to take off. And it, and it marked it for them. Because long had been the prophecy that the Messiah would come from Judah. So, July 12, Jupiter continues its path through the skies. The wise men are making preparation. They're gathering riches together. Fabulous riches together, apparently, as they make this journey. Uh, by the way, how many wise men were there? Don't say three. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know how many wise men there were. Three gifts are mentioned. But how many wise men? It could have been one. Could have been, well, it's more than one uh, because it says wise men. But it, it's probably an entourage that comes, of wise men who come. Uh, October 18th, Jupiter travels on, and the wise men should be ready to depart from Jerusalem by now, or maybe they've already left. I'm gonna, we're running off the screen over here, so I'm going to center up on screen again. And uh, now we move on to November 25. Jupiter moves on. The wise men are surely well on their way to Jerusalem by now. And then a short time later, Jupiter stops in the heavens again, and it begins retrograde motion again, and the wise men are now in Jerusalem. Now, you're looking from Babylon. We're going to change from Jerusalem, and that's what it looked like from Jerusalem. Uh, the star has stopped, and now I want to put in the horizon so we can see from earth where the star has stopped. You're standing in Jerusalem, but from earth's perspective, where is that? And we have to zoom out with our software to see the horizon and the view is from Jerusalem looking south. Slightly west of south from Jerusalem is the city of Bethlehem. The star is stopped over where the young child is. This is what the wise men saw when they went outside early in their morning on the way to Bethlehem. And they rejoiced with exceeding great joy when they saw that the star stood over where the young child was. How will they find this child when they get to Bethlehem? That's easy. The town is abuzz with stories the shepherds had been telling about his birth and the angels appearing. And I mean, it's all over town that, that uh, th this child had been born some several months or possibly a year or so uh, previous to this. Uh, and and uh, so it would be easy. You walk into town... Uh, is, is anything unusual about a child in this town being born? Like, oh, yeah, go down to 3rd Street, take a left, second house on the right. I mean, everybody in town uh, knew, knew, where, knew where this child was. So this is the day the wise men, in my opinion, uh, visit the Messiah in a house, the Scripture tells us, in Bethlehem. And Jesus is several months old now. Now, what is the date and time of this view and their visit? Isn't that amazing? 5 a.m. on the morning of December 25, 2 B.C., the time the star stood over where the young child was. And December 25 is the day I feel the wise men gave their gifts to the young Messiah. It's not the day Jesus was born. It's the day they go and give gifts to Him. Therefore, I think De December 25 is a wonderful day for us to celebrate 
that the king has been born. And to exchange gifts, reminding us of the greatest gift ever given, God gave His Son. What an amazing God. What an amazing God. Yeah. What an amazing God. Let me add something very interesting. Something the wise men would have immediately noticed because they understood the constellations and the message of the constellations before the devil messed it up. And, and I, notice that little cluster of stars right over Bethlehem. You see those stars down there? Those are constellations of stars that are part of the amazing story that I tell in the heavens declare. A story that's been told since creation. A story that Adam and Eve heard and passed it on to their children and their children after them. Uh, Over the city of Bethlehem that morning at 5 a.m. were the constellations Crux, the cross, Centaurus, the despised dual-natured one, Victima, the victim who freely gives his life, And Argo the ship, which represents all the followers of the Messiah, will safely arrive home. The ancient prophecies are declaring to the wise men that this child they are about to visit is destined for a cross. He will be despised and rejected by many. He will become the victim by freely giving up his life. No one will take it from him. Yet all who follow him will safely arrive at home with him. What an amazing declaration that first Christmas morning. What a wonderful and awesome Messiah. This is what the sky looked like to those wise men that morning. A few months previous, the heavens had declared the Messiah has been born to those who knew how to hear heaven's declarations. This is the star I believe the wise men followed. It fits all the Bible criteria and it just makes practical sense. There is no record of, a, of an asteroid or, or, or a supernova or anything uh, that... That, that astronomers uh, from all over would have noted that it happened during this time period. They're not there in history. So all it could have been historically as well as what our uh, astronomy tells us is a natural star that took explanation of what are the heavens declaring. And, and you see, God uses the simple things to confound those who think they are wise. And now you know what the star of Bethlehem was, which prompted these wise men to go to Jerusalem to worship the newborn king. And to me, it's extremely interesting that this stopped over where the young child was on December 25. Well, we must ask ourselves one question. Are we wise people? Do we worship the king? Wise men and women still worship him. Amen? They still worship him. Now, another thing, this is just real personal right here. I'm going to get on my little soapbox. But I'm fed up with people trying to remove Christ from Christmas. Don't offend anybody. Be politically correct. Listen, He is the reason for the season. That's why we have Christmas. That's what it's about. I refuse to marry Xmas anybody. And happy holidays is not a part of my vocabulary. It's Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. What a wonderful time of the year. God even had the stars to announce His birth in an awesome way. Now, now here is something amazing. For those planets to move like they did and conjunct where they did, for this to happen at exactly the time Christ was born means that God had to set it all in motion thousands of years before Christ was born. Do you understand that? Because got, it's got to happen at exactly this time. It had to be in place when Adam and Eve were cre- before Adam and Eve were created, as he as he spoke it all into existence, he set it in place such that some four thousand plus years after Adam and Eve are created, this starry dance takes place and tells some wise men the Messiah has been born. God's right on time, folks. 
God's always right on time. Let's give him another clap off. Hallelujah. Woo! What an amazing God. What an amazing, amazing God. Now, it's wonderful to see what these wise men saw. But now I want to show you something that will amaze you even more. If there were signs in the heavens at his birth, were there signs in the heaven at his death? Let's look and be amazed. (laughs) Then what were they, and how do we find them? Heavenly declarations at Christ's death. Okay, here we go. Let me get a little sip. First, we must establish the date of Christ's crucifixion. The date must be Nisan 14. That's Passover. Now, Nisan is a month in the Jewish calendar. Uh, It is always the month of Passover, which occurs on the 14th day of that month. Nisan would fall in our calendars during the months of March and April. Um, it's the next day must be the Sabbath because the Scripture tells us that the women waited until the first day of the week to visit the tomb. And it also tells us, uh, according to those Scriptures listed for you there, that Jesus was slain on Preparation Day. And Preparation Day is the day before the Sabbath. And so that would be a Friday. Uh, it tells us that Pilate was governor in Jerusalem. So the date of the crucifixion is Nisan 14, which would fall on a Friday in a year when Pilate was governor in Jerusalem, which was from 26 to 36 A.D. Jesus began his ministry when the Scripture says he was about 30 years of age. It doesn't say he was. He was about. We don't know. He may have been 32 or 3. He's about 30 years of age uh, when he started his ministry. His ministry lasted approximately three and one-half years. Therefore, the date of the crucifixion must be in the early 30s A.D. One Passover occurs during this time window on a Friday. Uh, That date is April 3, 33 A.D., according to our calendars. And following is how we discover the date. First of all, we must find Nisan 14 back in this period of time. Using astronomy software... We do that, and we, we find it because of the fact that Nisan is the first lunar month, a lunar month begins always with a new moon, whose 14th day falls on or after the vernal equinox. Now, the vernal equinox is when the path of the sun crosses our equator, and this marks the beginning of spring. So every year they tell you when spring starts, that's, when, that's the vernal equinox. So when you have a the, the first lunar month whose 14th day falls on or after the vernal equinox. Now here you are looking. Notice the horizon. That's the yellow line for you. The sun has just gone down. The astronomy software is allowing you to look through planet Earth uh, so, so that you can see everything below the horizon. Notice the new moon above the horizon. This is the first day of a lunar month. What you're looking at right now is 6 p.m., March the 20th, 33 A.D. Jewish days are from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. So this is the beginning of the day Nisan 1 in the Jewish calendar. The sun moves along the green line that you're looking at, and it has not yet reached the vernal equinox. But this is going to be a month in which the 14th day falls on or after the vernal equinox. So let's move forward 14 days. And the sun has just gone down and is now several days past the vernal equinox. This is the month Nisan because the 14th day, like we said, the time is 6 p.m. on April 2, 33 A.D., the beginning of the Jewish day, Nisan 14. Perpetual calendars show this to be on a Friday. So here's what we have found. Nisan 14 begins at 6 p.m. on April 2, 33 A.D. The daylight hours of Nisan 14 will be April 3, 33 A.D., which is a Friday. This is the date of the Passover. This is the date of the crucifixion. Now let's establish the time of the crucifixion. We got the date. What was the time? Well, Jesus' death occurred, we believe, at the time of the offering of the Passover lamb. When was that? Exodus 12, 6 says, Now you shall keep it, the sacrificial lamb, until the 14th day of the same month. When Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. 
The King James Version says, in the evening. The Hebrew says, between the evenings, or between noon and 6 p.m., or about 3 p.m. Matthew tells us, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, from noon to 3 p.m., there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and then verse 50 says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So Jesus died about the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., between the evenings. So the time of the death of Jesus was about 3 p.m. on Nisan 14. We know there was darkness from noon to 3 p.m. because Scripture tells us, tells us so. Was there anything else that happens uh, that, uh, during that time? I believe there was. And if you will look uh, with me in Acts chapter 2, this is after Jesus has died. This is after He's ascended back to heaven. He's preaching on the day of Pentecost. He's quoting from Joel chapter 2. And as he quotes from Joel chapter 2, he says, as he's testifying to these Jews, they need to come to this Christ. And he's telling them and verifying for them who Jesus is. And he says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And then in verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So the men of Israel had definitely seen the sun turn into darkness. Scripture tells us so. Uh, But did they see the moon turn to blood? And what is a blood moon? A blood moon is the reddish color of the moon when it is being eclipsed by the shadow of the earth. You remember how often in in, in an evening or in an early morning you've gone outside and you've seen a reddish sunset or a reddish sunrise. That is caused by the, as the sun either rises or set, that that the rays of the sun, the light of the sun is bending over the edge of the earth. As it bends over the edge of the earth and shines through our atmosphere... Many times it gives a reddish color. And that's why you have a reddish sunset or a reddish sunrise. When there is an eclipse and earth moves between the sun and the moon, then that reddish color shows onto the moon, and that's what's called a blood moon, the reddish color of the moon. So was there a blood moon the day that Jesus died or was crucified? Well, let's look at something astonishing here. I'm carrying you into outer space with my software, and it's a full moon that you're looking at, uh, which it would be for Nissan uh, 14 this particular year. On the other side of the earth from the sun, the earth always casts a shadow. Of course, you couldn't see that shadow in space, so the software has drawn you the earth's shadow in space. Uh, The time and date is 12 noon, April 3, 33 A.D. Let's move forward by one-hour intervals. It's now 1 p.m. You see the the shadow is closing in. 2 p.m. 3 p.m. The moon is beginning, uh, or, or the moon is being eclipsed by the earth. And the moon is starting to turn to blood at 3 p.m. At the time of the death of Jesus on the cross, the moon begins to turn to blood. And when the moon rose that evening in Jerusalem, it would be a blood moon. The date and time here is 5.30 p.m., April 3rd, 33 A.D. The yellow line is the horizon. We've turned off uh, so you can see through what's going on down below the horizon. The view is from Jerusalem looking east as the moon is about to rise. The sun would be out, but we've got it turned off so you can see what's going on. And it would be going down in the west. Day, uh, and so this is 5.30 This is 6 o'clock. The uh, moon uh, has just risen in the east. It is 6.30. It's still a blood moon. It is 7 o'clock. It's about to come out from being a blood moon. It's it's, uh, exiting the shadow by 7.30. It will no longer be a blood moon. It is now 7.30 p.m. The moon is a full moon. Notice this. Under the feet of Virgo. Compare this to the new moon 
that was under her feet on September 12, 3 B.C., in Revelation 12, 1, and here's what you have. This, to me, is a declaration that the life cycle of Jesus on earth is complete. It began with a woman clothed with the sun with a new moon under her feet. It concludes with a woman clothed in darkness with a full moon under her feet. We have a complete cycle has come here. Truly, Jesus, as he said on the cross, it is finished. And the heavens have declared the glory of God. What an amazing God to do such things. But what about that other sign that day? Darkness from the sixth to the ninth hour. Uh, History, secular history, even records such an event. This is completely secular history. In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, that would be somewhere in 32, 33 A.D., a failure of the sun took place greater than any previously known, and night came on at the sixth hour of the day, noon, so that the stars actually appeared in the sky. So secular history also tells us that this event took place. Now, uh, what caused this darkness that the men of Israel saw that day? It was not an eclipse of the sun uh, by the moon. In other words, because the moon's a full moon. You can't have an eclipse of the sun and a full moon. It's impossible. It's always a new moon that eclipses the sun because you've got to see the sun shining on it. It's a full moon. So it's not an eclipse that took place. What was it? And I was asking God, what was it, God? And I found this scripture. Look at this. Uh, in Amos 8, God is admonishing Israel for her sins as a nation, and he prophesies these words. It shall come to pass in that day, that says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Now let me have your attention for a moment. There is only one way possible for a straight up 12 noon sun for the, you to see the sun go down at noon. The only way possible is God has to take planet earth and rotate it 180 degrees. As God rotates planet earth 180 degrees, you would have seen the, the sun go whop right wherever west is around here. I don't know what direction it is. But you would have seen the sun just drop as soon as he spun earth. And you say, wow, if God did that, I mean, tidal waves and monsoons and all kinds of things. Well, not necessarily. God knows how to take care of things. Has God ever done anything unusual with the earth before? Yeah. What do you have with Joshua? And he's fighting a battle. And what does the sun do? Stand still. For the sun to stand still, what does earth have to do? Stop its rotation on its axis. Not only are we traveling through space at 66,600 miles per hour, on the surface of the earth, we're spinning at 1,100 miles per hour. That's how fast earth spins around. And God had to stop it for a whole day. Oh, uh, Isaiah chapter 38, the sundial. What did the sun do on the sundial? It went backwards 10 degrees on the sundial. What does that mean God had to do? Not only stop earth, back it up. Isn't God awesome? Can God do what he wants to with planet earth? So I believe the day Christ was crucified, God spun the earth 180 degrees. This is a traumatic event that is taking place, folks. It ought to be some major signs go on. And they saw the sun go down at noon. But when they saw the sun go down at noon and when God spun the earth 180 degrees, they would have also seen this take place because they would be over on the other side where the moon is and they would have seen just as Jesus was giving up his life at Calvary just as he was saying it is finished they would have looked up and seen the moon is starting to turn to blood and then God spun it back around because it says the daylight came back and they would have known that evening when the sun, when the moon rose, they would have known it was going to be a blood moon that they were going to see. So Peter said in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. So I believe this included the signs in the heavens which they had seen. The day Christ died, they saw the sun go down at noon and they saw the moon turn to blood at about 3 p.m., Exactly as Christ died. What an amazing heavenly declaration 
that this truly is the Son of God. Amen? Amen? Wow. What an amazing declaration. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Folks, many religions will tell you Jesus is a good man. Many religions will tell you He's a great prophet. Jesus was the Son of God. (laughs) There's a vast difference. And God, in my opinion, without question, had the heavens declare, this is Him. This is Him. Listen to Him. Receive Him. Take Him. He is the Savior of the world. But I want to show you something else. Let's get amazed some more. (laughs) Oh, I want to show you something I find very interesting. No one on earth could have seen what I'm about to show you. We have to travel to the moon. I'm fixing to take you to the moon. Remember where that eclipse took place? We're going to travel to the moon and look back at earth on, on the day this happened, God, of course, would have known it. And now with astronomy software, we can see what only God knew April 3, 33 A.D. You are now viewing space from the surface of the moon. When the moon turned to blood on the day Jesus was crucified, the sun and earth were in the constellation. That little line up there above them is the constellation Aries. And Aries is the constellations whose message is... If you hear my other study, it's the victorious lamb at rest. The lamb is lying down to rest. Aries says, it is finished. He has given his life. The lamb is now at rest. He has completed his work. And this all happened in the constellation that says he has completed his work. What an amazing God. What amazing evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. God the Father even had the heavens to de- declare it to us. What about amazing attention to detail? For all this to have happened when it did, God had to set the heavenly bodies in motion when He created the heavens before Adam and Eve were created several thousand years before the events took place in the heavens. As I've told you, astronomy is such an exact science. For the planets to move through heavens in such a manner that wise men would be quickened to action at the exact time of the birth of Christ, as I've already said, means that God had to set it in motion thousands of years before this event was to take place. This is beyond coincidence. For the moon to turn to blood at the precise moment when Christ gives up His life at Calvary and says it is finished means that God had to set it in motion thousands of years before the event was to take place This, too, is beyond coincidence. It was all planned, folks. It was planned to the most amazing detail. This means God knew the exact moment of the birth and death of the Messiah before Adam and Eve were formed. This means Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The heavens loudly declare it. Truly, Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God set it all up. You know why? Because He loves you so much. The whole thing was to was you in mind. It was about you. He wanted he wants a people who will understand this love of God is amazing indeed. The vastness of the heavens is really an explanation of the vastness of the extravagant love of God for mankind on earth. Oh, how He wants a relationship with you and with me. How He desires it so much. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What an amazing God. What a wondrous Lord that He would reach out to me, a little old old country boy from East Texas, 
completely unimportant in more ways than you can imagine, in my opinion. And he allowed his son to come and die for me. And it was precisely at the moments that even the heavens declared it when it happened. He is, he is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. There is a God in heaven. And we are responsible to that God. We must acknowledge that God and we must realize that we are to give an account to that God and it's not an account of what you did wrong. It's an account of here, I'm reaching out to you. Of all the gods people worship on earth today, our God is the only God that loves sinners. I qualify. Hallelujah. I qualify. And I came to Him when I was 16 years of age. And I've walked with Him for all of those years since. Soon be 50 years that I have walked with Him. And it's been awesome. He has proven Himself again and again and again. He is God. And He loves me. I'm His favorite kid. And every child of God ought to feel like that. He is so for you. He's, he's, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You don't come to God any other way than through Him. And Jesus also said, I have come that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. Oh, the life I've had. Wow. What a wonderful life. Spent 43 years with the finest woman on earth. She loves God. What a life I've had, folks. I got three kids and, and six grandkids. You want me to tell you about them? I mean, I mean I've, had, I've, had, I've had this awesome life. I know people like Alan and Yvette and, and some new people I've met here, and now I'm getting to know you. I'm, I'm having an abundant life. I've got the best of friends on earth. I sleep good at night. I walk with a clear conscience. It's good to walk with God. Jesus said, I've come that you can have the best that there is. People that really, really care about you. People that, that are really real people. and It's just the best. Now, I want you to have the best. I want you to have the best. And, and I, want, I want, if you're here and, and you've never yet said yes to Christ, the evidence is beyond doubt. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. And today you need to say yes and make Him Lord of your life. If you have said that to Him, but your walk's not yet what you know it should be, and, and you know deep in your heart... Today is a day to let's settle this. I'm going to walk with Him the way He should be walked with. He is the Son of God. So I'm going to ask us to stand. We'll ask some of our musicians maybe to come. We'll ask the pastor and, uh, to come and, and uh, any of the team that he would have to, to come to, to stand here and, and minister to you. And uh, we're, just, we're just going to uh, ask... God to be God here uh, in our midst. You can bring the lights back up if you want to. Uh, and let's let God be God. Let's just bow our heads for a moment here. Almighty God in heaven, come into this place. Come here in our midst. Or maybe better I should say, thank you for being here in our midst. Thank you for co coming amongst us. And Holy Spirit, now have your Flow among us. Walk among us. Be among us. Be our God in every way. Father, for any who are here who have not yet said yes to Christ, maybe they said yes to joining a church, but that's not what it's about. Maybe they joined a religion, but that's not what it's about. If they've not yet said yes to Jesus, the Savior and the Lord, May today be the day you say yes to Jesus, the Savior and the Lord. Wherever you are right now, I just want to pray with you. If you're here 
And you know that Christ, and you've, you've just got this witness, something's, something's happening inside you, and you know that it's time to settle things and make things right with Christ, and you know who you are, then, then do that today. Pray this prayer with me. I'm, everybody join me in this prayer so we can help everybody else. But pray this prayer with me. Father God, I come to you today because I know in my spirit, in my heart, that you love me with an extravagant love. And you have proven that love by sending your Son, your only Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And He came at exactly the right moment, at exactly the right time. And He walked here without sin. And He came for me to be my Savior, to be a Lord that I can look to, a Lord who can direct my life, a Lord who can lead me to abundant life. And so I come today, Lord, to make you my Savior, to make you the Lord of my life. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Save me from my sin. Forgive me of my wrong. Live in me. Be my Lord. Help me to walk with you all the rest of the days of my life. Teach me your ways. Show me your paths. Cause me to walk the way I should walk. Help me to experience the abundant life in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Thank you, God, for the gift of eternal life and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the love of God that's poured out into all who believe in you. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If the ministry team would stand here, listen, I just want to open this. This is a good day right here at the Christmas season. This is a good day to rededicate to God and to walk with a God who has so proven Himself to us. I ask you to take a step out today and say, I want to do better. I want to do more. Or if you've received Christ, come and let one of these people pray for you. Would you come right now? Would you come right now? He's our God.